All right, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar, or today, if you're watching this recording during the day. Um, the focus of the webinar is coping with shift work and on-call duties in veterinary practice. And for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Dr. Marie Holloway-Chuck, and I will be facilitating the webinar this evening. I'm a small animal emergency and critical care specialist, and I have a, a devoted passion to health and well-being in the veterinary profession. So um, that might be where um, some of you know of me. Um, I'll talk more about uh, that towards the end. Um, but just to acquaint you, I know some of you may be new to Zoom, although these days with the pandemic, I think a lot of us are spending time on Zoom and Skype and, and similar platforms. Um, I am uh, going to keep everybody muted and their videos off for this session, just to minimize distraction for everybody else who's watching. Um, please feel welcome. Um, we're a relatively small group and um, this is uh, pretty informal, so I'm very open to questions at any time. Um, I'll watch for them to come up in the chat, and if it feels like the right place to stop and answer those questions, and I certainly will. Otherwise, I will be happy to take whatever questions that you might have towards the end of the session. So we will go ahead and get started. And I'm going to just start by um, acknowledging, uh, of course, the reason why you're all here, that veterinary practice, of course, is 24-7. Even if you don't work in a 24-7 practice, animals just don't stop getting sick outside of hours. And so there is going to be some need for them to um, be uh, receiving veterinary care outside of the nine to five. Um, so what this means, unfortunately, is that some veterinary team members end up having to work off shift. Um, and off shift is just the general phrase for out of hours or after hours um, of what people would consider, again, that normal nine to five. Um, in veterinary medicine as well, we often have on-call requirements. That's, of course, a way for practices to offer off-shift care, but without paying those um, individuals to be in the hospital um, all the time. And the downside uh, for most of us when we're working off-shift is that there tend to be fewer employees in the hospital, um, fewer amount of resources, and sometimes a higher caseload. Now, that depends where you practice. And that depends on the role of the people working off shift. There's a lot of hospitals um, whereby the off shift workers will take over the management of all of those cases in the hospital, which can you know, really add to the caseload given that they're also potentially seeing a lot of cases at the door um, incoming as well. And for some of you, you might prefer working off shift just because there are fewer people in the hospital. Um, this is very much a personal preference. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, some people definitely gravitate towards working um, outside of the regular hours um, just for the sake of, of having fewer um, interactions and distractions. So all of that said, um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be about the consequences of off-shift work. Now, I don't want to defer anybody from working off-shift. A lot of what I share, um, all of it is research-driven, and, and some of it may be a little bit um, disturbing or, or shocking if you didn't know this already. Um, what I can tell you is that the vast majority of the consequences of off-shift work can be offset by a change of mindset and by adopting really healthy habits like proper sleep hygiene and proper self-care. So unfortunately, what ends up happening is a lot of individuals who work off shift do not have healthy lifestyles. And it's not so much the off shift work that contributes to these consequences, it's the unhealthy lifestyle that contributes. Um, so we're going to talk about, um, of course, sleep deprivation being a huge factor. There are mental health ramifications as well. People can struggle with gastrointestinal disturbances, and some people just do not like working off shift. And that, of course, would result in job dissatisfaction. And then for some people, um, burnout, especially for those individuals who are working off shift, but then they have other duties um, in their regular day, like childcare um, or other things, especially um, now with the ongoing pandemic. 
So the reality is, and the reason why most of us struggle with off shift is because we're not vampires. We were not made to be working at night. Most people are diurnal, meaning we were meant to sleep during the night and stay awake during the day. This is of course dictated by circadian rhythm and our circadian rhythm is regulated by our exposure to natural light and our endogenous hormones that get secreted in response to that light exposure, specifically melatonin um, being the biggest one. Um, it's also uh, a lot to do with our activity level. Again, most of us are more energetic during the day than we are at night. Um, but it's not so simple as you're a day person or a night person. We often talk about, are you a lark or are you a night owl? Um, there's actually probably at least four chronotypes of individuals, um, but only a very small segment of the population that can really easily adjust their sleep patterns um, in terms of sleeping uh, during the day. So a lot of individuals require a lot of very strict sleep hygiene in order to be able to facilitate off shift work. Um, because essentially it's, it's doing just that, it's disrupting our circadian rhythm. And so getting that consolidated sleep during the day can be hard. It's, it goes against our natural rhythm. And then staying awake at night can also be equally hard. And we'll talk about strategies to combat that. For most individuals, the alertness is lowest for us between one and four o'clock in the morning. Now, again, this varies from person to person. I'm not gonna lie, I hit the wall at about nine, nine thirty at night. Um, some people, you know, can go into the wee hours of the morning. Um, but of course, if you're working overnights, this is when you need to be functioning normally, and that can be tricky for a lot of people. So I want to go back to the consequences of shift work that I briefly mentioned before. And a lot of people refer to these consequences um, as being a result of shift lag, kind of like jet lag. So if you're switching time zones, your sleep cycles are off, you're awake when you were supposed to be sleeping at home and you just feel awful. Fatigue, sleepiness, can't get into your regular sleep cycle, you feel disoriented, some people will have stomach upset, you feel irritable, um, you feel like you can't focus, like your mental ability is dwindling, um, and you may also not be able to perform as efficiently or as effectively as you normally would. And I think all of us have experienced that, whether it was in school, if we weren't getting enough sleep, we couldn't focus for an exam, or you know, during internship or residency training, or certainly as veterinarians, if we got called in the night before and we were up all night, sometimes it can be really hard to be effective the next day. So all of this is researched um, evidence, most of it among human healthcare nurses, but also in other non-healthcare related professions. Um, people who work night shifts tend to have a low, lower overall health and well-being scores and unfortunately a predisposition to health problems. And again, I think very often this is because um, they are not um, engaging in, in healthy, um, healthy habits and self-care. Um, Again, there is also sleep deprivation, and we'll talk about how to combat that. And then, of course, stress, right? The more stress that you have in your life, whether it's because your work doesn't align with your desired lifestyle, or whether it's the stress of these overnight shifts and maybe being improperly staffed or other things that are affecting you, but that's obviously going to impact your health as well. So there are studies that demonstrate an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, specifically coronary artery disease, like heart attacks. Um, certainly pregnancy related issues. There's a lot of studies in nurses to demonstrate that lower birth weights, miscarriage and preterm birth are more common among night shift workers. Peptic ulcer disease is also more common. Diabetes is more common. And depending on what you read, there are some studies that suggest that cancer might even be more common. Now, these studies are very controversial. Um, they tend to be very small numbered and, and unfortunately relatively biased. And again, it's hard when we're looking at these um, issues retrospectively to say it's because they were on night shift versus some other factor, um, like individuals had a more tendency to smoke or various other things. So um, don't put too much stock in that. That. And if you take anything good away from this, it's that there's absolutely no research to suggest that people who work night shifts or um, working rotating shifts have an altered lifespan. So again, um, you know, we, we take, take the good that we can get, of course, for those of us who are working off shift. 
Now, there are definitely studies to suggest that shift work is associated with weight gain, and this is pretty logistical when you think about it. There's fewer opportunities for physical activity. Again, our whole world is turned upside down right now, so it's not like anybody's going um, to the gym right now, um, but certainly people who tend to work nights um, or swing shifts even maybe um, have a less predisposition to going to an exercise class, um, certainly joining rec teams. Um, sports teams can be very difficult when you're not working a nine to five. And what's really interesting um, from a physiologic perspective is that those individuals who are working shift work also have a, a dysregulated response to exercise. And I don't know if any of you um, have ever been heavy into training in your life, but um, for, for, for those individuals who have trained for Ironmans and, and, and triathlons and really intensive um, competitive training, there, there is, there, you have to be very careful that you're getting sufficient sleep, sufficient nutrition, and everything else to support your progress. And there is something to be said about overtraining. And so what seems to happen with shift workers is um, probably because they're not getting enough sleep, they're not complementing their training with nutrition, or they're training when they're very fatigued, they're not going to get the same, um, you know, uh, effect in their body and in their performance um, as an individual who was in a nine to five and had all the regular self care routines in place. Um, the other interesting thing to consider is that amongst shift workers, there's a lot of hormonal changes, changes um, in melatonin, of course, because of that difference in light exposure, um, difference in our cortisol, our stress hormone, and then ghrelin and leptin, which are hormones that regulate our hunger and our appetite. And what's really interesting and what I only learned doing this research on shift work um, and uh, health concerns is that melatonin is actually needed to synthesize and activate insulin. So it, it makes sense that if your melatonin release and your light exposure are dysregulated, that you could be more at risk to insulin resistance um, and or diabetes. Um, again, reduced sleep, altered activity levels, altered eating habits and stress also, of course, contribute to the metabolic dysfunction. What's really interesting among shift workers in the human healthcare field is that total calorie intake and meal composition are actually not generally affected. Most people are pretty good about, you know, overall of the day, still taking in the amount of calories and meals that they need to. Um, meal frequency tends to be reduced. Um, and I think those of us who've, who've even worked a very long day shift recognize that. It's like you don't eat all day and then you have giant dinner when you get home. Um, and so again, we're not, you know, kind of eating as we normally would. Um, what we know amongst shift workers is that snacking tends to happen more frequently and that metabolic response to food is altered. And again, it all comes down to sleep and whether or not you're getting sufficient sleep. Totally independently of shift work, there are so many studies now that demonstrate that sleep is almost more important or at least as important as exercise when it comes to regulating weight. So people can be training, 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 or working out like crazy, but if they're really not getting enough sleep, then they're not going to see the same um, effectiveness in managing their weight. Although most of us also recognize that calorie intake and, and what you are eating is much more um, impactful on your weight than um, the actual amount of exercise that you're doing. So some of the reasons why we are disrupted in terms of what we eat is because we maybe can't get the foods that we want. Um, very often if we're looking to get takeout in the middle of the night, we're pretty limited to McDonald's, A&W, and whatever fast food restaurants might be open. Um, two, if your shifts are very long, um, you might be really prioritizing sleep, which means you're, um, if you haven't planned ahead of time, then you're not going to have prepared meals. Um, and for a lot of people, myself included, when I'm working overnight, I just don't have the same appetite. And again, it's often because of disrupted sleep, which doesn't activate the same hunger hormones that we would have activated during the day. And a lot of us are just out of our routines when we're working um, swing shifts or overnight shifts. And so we just, you know, we're not in the same habit of we get up, we exercise, we eat breakfast, we go to work, you know, it's just kind of all over the place. 
So stepping away from, from eating and body weight and that sort of thing, um, one of the other things that um, I also want to talk about, of course, is shift work and social wellness. So it is, of course, not uncommon for people who are working overnights to feel out of sync with society. I think all of us feel out of sync with society right now, um, but especially when we're not, you know, out and about during the day like most people are. Most family and social activities are arranged according to the nine to five work of the general population. So stuff gets scheduled on the weekends when some people are working, stuff gets scheduled in the evenings. And if you're working evenings, swings or overnights, then you're gonna miss out on those things and this can really impact relationships and especially people who have a family or in a family in terms of the role and the dynamics of the childcare and, and what everybody is doing. There's also can be a sense of social marginalization, again interfering with scheduling and duties at home and reduced access to um, normal, you know, day-to-day -day activities like grocery shopping, taking public transportation because it stops at, you know, one o'clock in the morning or what have you, um, or going to wellness appointments like the doctor or the dentist or massage or whatever it is that you might have done during the day. And this can lead to a lot of psychological distress for individuals in terms of really feeling out of sync. Now, again, this is very inter-individual. Um, these are just generalizations that, that they have found. And certainly childcare can be a huge thing. Now, of course, childcare is a huge thing for all of us right now in the face of COVID-19, but certainly during our regular life, um, when you are working overnights, this can be incredibly difficult. And I, I know a good friend of mine from high school is a paramedic firefighter and so is her husband. They work 24 hour shifts and, and they, the two of them work together so that they actually get time away from work together as well. So what that means is that they usually have, you know, a 48 hour period during the week when they're on shift that they have to find childcare. Um, and that you can imagine is incredibly difficult. Now, I wanna talk also um, and spend a lot of time talking about sleep disturbances and how we can mitigate things because you know we can't take away the need for off shift work, but we can control how we take care of ourselves when we are working off shift. So what we do know about night shift workers is that they rarely get the recommended seven, time, seven to nine hours of sleep per day that is advocated for adults. Now remember, not everybody needs seven to nine hours. Some of you might be lucky enough to feel very rested at five to six hours. It is extraordinarily rare, but there are people with a genetic um, advantage who, who can feel great just sleeping four hours. Vast majority of adults, unfortunately, seven to nine hours, and some people even more. Some people need 10 hours to really feel rested. And of course, that varies depending on, you know, are you pregnant? Do you have other things going on in your life? Are you recovering from illness? Um, and then, of course, certainly younger individuals are going to have a need for more sleep than that. So what overnight nurses have reported um, in the human healthcare field is that sleep disturbances and quality of sleep um, become poorer when they're working um, shift work. And that very often if they're working overnights that they have difficulty staying awake for the second half, to, half of the shift, which I think all of us can relate to if you've worked in overnight. And this definitely seems to be worse when rotating from days to nights compared to permanent night shift workers. So when I talk to managers about this who are running ER clinics, this is a really big point to take into consideration in terms of how we schedule our teams. If you have individuals who really like being on overnights, it's really important to keep them on overnights. And, and I know there's pros and cons to that from an overall you know, hospital management perspective, but it's better for their well-being to be permanently on nights. We'll talk about the ideal way to rotate through shifts, um, but definitely, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely better to not be rotating if you don't have to be rotating. 
If you do end up rotating, so when I talk about rotating, I'm talking about you go from days to swings to nights, or some people are just day or night. They do 12 hours opposite each other. Um, you want to rotate as slowly as possible. I have worked at some hospitals where um, the nurses especially will be, you know, one day they're on days and then the next day they're on a swing and then they might have two days off and then they're working nights. Um, that is impossible to switch your circadian rhythm and adopt to that. If you do have a schedule like that, then essentially you're going to use the habits that I talk about in terms of trying to stay awake during your shift and napping to kind of make up for those deficits, but you never can actually acclimate your circadian rhythm if you're literally changing your shifts within a couple, you know, three to five day period. So slowly rotating shifts. So ideally this would be shifts that are scheduled for 12 hour shifts that rotate every four weeks with seven days off in between. So basically for a month, you're on day shifts, you have a week off and then you go to swings or you go to nights or whatever it is, um, but that you give yourself a month to be able to acclimate. What we also know is that night shifts have the greatest effect on sleep length, especially if they are rotating onto a night rather than permanently onto night. So what that means is that people are most likely to have not enough sleep when they are working in the, in the night. Believe it or not, morning shifts are not much better. So people who have to start their shift early in the morning, six o'clock, you know, ish in the morning, they also have reduced sleep. And that's probably because they have family and social obligations that are keeping them up late at night. So if you didn't guess it already, people who work swing shifts actually have the best amount of sleep. So they tend to have, um, you know, the capability of sleeping in, but also staying up late. And um, that tends to be quite favorable for some people. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when people are permanent night shift workers or what some people refer to as fixed night shift workers, they do adjust better. Um, it's unclear based on studies where it's out of necessity that they adjust um, or if it's a true adjustment in their circadian rhythm. There are some studies where they've actually measured melatonin levels among night shift workers and it, it's not very convincing that they actually change their hormone levels to synchronize their sleep to be um, releasing melatonin during the day. Um, but yet they seem to, from a, um, you know, a, a, a questionnaire perspective, seem to feel rested and that they can tolerate. Um, so, What's interesting is that there are um, not just short-term ramifications of working shift work, like having your sleep disrupted, digestive upset, anxiety, and irritability, but there are some long-term disturbances as well. And um, unfortunately, there are studies that demonstrate that depression and depressive episodes can definitely um, increase with long-term um, I should say increase in the long term for those individuals who are working shift work. And I can tell you based on my understanding of the research of depression is that depression is very much synchronized also with sleep disturbances. So unfortunately, if individuals um, who are working shift work are not getting sufficient sleep um, or they're using napping to supplement and, and get their daily sleep um, because of the sleep cycles and the importance of REM in order to have emotional regulation. Um, if they're not sleeping for a long duration of time, that, that seven to nine hour time period, they're not going to be spending very much time in REM and that is going to have consequences in terms of their mental health. Now, not for everyone, but if you have a predisp predisposition to depression, then you very much want to be mindful of this because this could absolutely impact you. We also know that shift work has a association with mistakes in the hospital. Now, again, this is not to say that individuals working the day don't make mistakes because I definitely know that that is not true, having made many mistakes myself during the day. Um, but what we actually is very interesting is that it seems to be more associated with shift duration um, as well as when the shift is scheduled. So anytime we get past the eight hour shift mark, there's going to be an increase in the medical errors. Um, in fact, 12 hour shifts have twice as many accidents in human hospitals as eight hour shifts. 
um, and you put shift work on top of that and even more there's a risk of things not happening properly um, again lower incidence in permanent night shift workers whether it's that they synchronize or they adapt we don't know um, but again making the case to be on permanent nights um, or permanent swings if that's an option in human medicine, again, nurses report higher incidence of errors and accidents when rotating from days to nights. And research in human medicine residents shows more errors and slower performance of simulated surgeries and endoscopies after rotating on night shifts. So again, that um, rotating and that flip-flopping all over the place is very detrimental to our efficiency and our effectiveness. So we'll pause for humor here. Can I trade you the 3 to 4 p.m. shift playing with the kids for the 6 p.m. greeting of master? Wouldn't it be nice if we, although for many people now, um, shifts have, have really changed. I've talked to a lot of veterinarians who've gone from 8 to 10 hour shifts to 12 hour shifts to minimize, you know, exposure to other team members. And, um, and then, of course, I've talked to a lot of non-veterinary individuals who are working from home and shifts literally are who's teaching the kids and who's cooking the dinner and who's making the espresso because we're not going to Starbucks and <laughs> everything else. So um, our shifts have definitely changed as well. All right, so I'm going to um, leave consequences and, and complications of shift work um, for now. And I'm going to talk about how we overcome um, having to work these shifts when we're feeling exhausted um, and when we can't seem to get the sleep that we need. So in order to enhance alertness during shifts, um, a lot of research has gone into this. And interestingly, a lot of the research is around um, people in the armed forces. So uh, there's a lot of research looking, I laugh, it's not very funny, but it's the reality looking at amphetamines and things like that to keep soldiers alert and awake and able to function for longer. Um, I'm not gonna talk about amphetamines because of course that is not something I would recommend. Um, people have looked at sensory stimulation though. So bright lights, um, sounds, music, um, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I um, am driving in the car and I'm having a really hard time staying awake, you know, I will crank up the music, um, I will turn on the air conditioning full blast so that I'm freezing cold, you know, whatever we can do. And interestingly, speaking of um, soldiers, you know, these are uh, also torture tactics that they use to prevent, um, you know, to prevent uh, uh, captured people from, from sleeping. Anyways, I digress. And clearly I've watched too much TV because um, these things are on my mind for some reason. Um, the, the reality is, is that methods to enhance alertness um, that fall into these categories are only good in the short term. These are not meant to be used long term and they're not successful for everyone. Some people could sleep through, you know, the Titanic sinking and, and there would be um, you know, they would be snoring away. Um, so caffeine, believe it or not, is very heavily studied as well and is considered a natural pharmacologic intervention. Um, it definitely improves alertness and ability to stay awake. For most individuals, this would be two cups of regular coffee. And when I mean cup, I don't mean like a venti. I mean like a tall cup of coffee. Um, twice during a shift, okay? So about two to four milligrams per kilogram is what they would recommend. Now, the downside with caffeine is that there are side effects and some of us are very caffeine sensitive. I'm like this cat over here. I just hardly need the tiniest bit of caffeine and then you have to like peel me off the ceiling. I, I run on pure energy um, of life most of the time. Um, so what some people experience is trembling, fast heart rates, anxiousness, nervousness, certainly digestive troubles, sleep disruption, and then tolerance is a big thing. If you're into caffeine, then you will probably notice that the more you drink, the more you need to stay awake, and that can be really frustrating. 
The other big thing to remember about caffeine is that it has a very long half-life, six to eight hours it stays in the system for a lot of people. So if you're very caffeine sensitive, then you wanna cut yourself off at least six hours before you want to be sleeping. So if your bedtime is 10 o'clock, then you should not be having caffeine after four o'clock in the afternoon. And I know some people who cut themselves off even at noontime um, because they just find that they're so caffeine sensitive. Something else that individuals will do, or um, I should say that has been studied in individuals to maintain alertness is to take breaks. Um, so take pauses for social interaction and physical activity. We are so busy in veterinary hospitals. A lot of this research has been done with people like on assembly lines or people at very sedentary jobs. We are not very sedentary in our jobs. Even when we're doing paperwork, we're answering phones, we're checking on patients, we're you know, doing various other things. But if you find yourself in uh, the midst of a very sedentary, boring shift, then you do wanna change things up. Or if you are in a managerial position and you're doing a lot of desk work, you do want to take pauses. You want to go talk to somebody, maybe do like a seven minute quick workout in your office or find a place in the hospital where you could step away and do that. Um, that decreases monotony. Um, we don't really know how often and for how long, um, but most of the time people will say every one and a half to two hours, we should be changing things up or taking, you you know, a couple of minutes um, to have a bit of a break. Now, of course, when it comes to lunchtime, <laughs> I love this nurse's comment. We have a laugh track. We push every time a new nurse asks when we take lunch or get to go to the bathroom. Um, I know some of you guys are just so busy right now. Your caseloads have just gone up exponentially because of, um, you know, hospitals closing or, or otherwise. Um, for some people, it might be the opposite and you might have the opportunity to actually take breaks. Um, I do urge you to definitely take advantage of breaks when you can. Now, I want to talk about napping as well. So opportunities for rest or sleep that occur outside of your normal sleep and are less than 25% of a normal night's sleep duration would be considered a nap. And we can use naps because we're anticipating not getting a lot of sleep or in order to sustain alertness because we feel exhausted. So short rest periods or naps have massive benefits for shift workers. This has been proven in many different studies. What we know based on our sleep you know, needs is that that seven to nine hours of sleep per day is cumulative, not necessarily consecutive. Now, if you struggle with your mental health, then you would like it to be consecutive. That's going to help you get into more cycles of REM towards the end of your sleep period, and that's going to help with your mental health. But if mental illness is not an issue for you, um, then you could nap just like they do in Europe where they, you know, sleep for six hours at night and then they have a two hour siesta in the afternoon. What that does is it gives you a normal cumulative sleep, it resets your biorhythm, and it helps to offset those cardiovascular and GI side effects of sleep deprivation. We actually see benefits of napping with as little as a five to 20 minute nap. The longer the nap, the greater the effect, but you have to be careful and you have to listen to your body because we sleep in different cycles. So we go through, gosh, anywhere between three to four sleep cycles a night. And what that means is that we go from a period of alertness into light sleep, deep sleep, and then we come up into REM, which is where our body is heavily sleeping, but our brain is processing and thinking and um, consolidating memories and replaying tasks. That whole cycle takes about 90 to 120 minutes. For, for different individuals, it can be longer or shorter, and it gets shorter towards the end of the night, which is why you spend more time in REM towards the end of the night. So what that means is that if you wake up out of a really deep sleep, 
you are going to feel super groggy. And that's why some people say, I don't like to nap. I'm not a good napper. I always feel like crap after I nap. So you have to be mindful that maybe that duration of nap is not what works for you. Maybe you need a little bit less, maybe you need a little bit more. Um, but for a lot of individuals, napping can be very beneficial. And the most benefit in terms of enhancing alertness and reducing fatigue is when it happens at the nadir of your night shift. So that one to 4 a.m. period rather than at the beginning. So you don't wanna nap early in your shift, you wanna nap um, during kind of the midway part of your shift. And again, you don't wanna nap too late in your shift either. Like if you're napping, you know, between six and 7 a.m., but then, you know, you, you, you're gonna be home at eight o'clock and then you wanna be in bed by nine, that's gonna be a little bit offsetting um, or off-putting to your uh, natural circadian rhythm. So the disadvantages of naps, um, again, uh, there are disadvantages and there are advantages. The, the major advantage, of course, is that you um, reduce the amount of sleep in your total sleep period. Or how do I put this? If you're supposed to get eight hours of sleep and you nap for an hour during your shift, then when you go home, you only have to sleep seven hours, okay? Um, so that gives you more time to do other things, right? Um, unfortunately, a disadvantage for a lot of people, well, number one, some hospitals are just way too busy to facilitate napping. So, um, you know, there are hospitals that they're quiet enough that, yeah, if you get an hour of lunch, you can eat for 15 minutes and then you could nap for 45 minutes. Um, some people's hospitals just can't accommodate that. And for some people, there's a profound period of sleep inertia. This is like the real grogginess that a person feels when they wake up. Um, again, you can offset this grogginess by exposing your excuse me, exposing yourself to really bright lights or loud noises, do some activity, have some coffee. Um, but for some people, um, it's just not worth it to them to, to nap for that 20 to 30 minute period if they're gonna have that hypervigilance after. Um, but studies suggest that even when sleep inertia occurs, night shift napping is associated with improved performance and decreased sleepiness. So even if you're like, oh, I hate how I feel when I get up from a nap, physiologically and, and from a functional perspective, you're probably still better served by having that nap. Okay, another uh, cartoon here. So I was going to ask about your change from day shift, how your change from day to night shift was going, but I can guess the answer. Um, I don't know about you guys. I, you know, when I would work overnights, I would always have eye drops on me because I would just get like such dry eye from <laughs> having my eyes open. And, and I don't know if we forget to blink somehow when we're on nights, but um, I definitely would sometimes look like this this nurse here. Okay, so how else can we adjust our circadian rhythm? So we talked about light being one of the big determinants of our circadian rhythm. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're getting light exposure in, ideally blue light or broad spectrum UV light. Um, now there's kind of a bit of controversy in terms of what spectrum, in terms of like wavelength and intensity and brightness the studies it's like waft, wading through the the weeds to kind of like you know because every study looks at some sort of different wavelength duration brightness etc what it seems what the sleep experts seem to say is that as long as it's full spectrum like replicating sunlight usually it looks like these blue lights um and that could even be a grow light like a light that you would use to grow I don't know why marijuana just came into my head. Um, <laughs> I guess if you were growing marijuana in your house, um, I was thinking um, probably more appropriately, like if you were in an office with no light and you had to grow light over your plants or something like that. Um, anyway, so regardless of the light, um, you know, exactly what wavelength or what brightness, um, the longer that you can be exposed to it, up to about six hours at the beginning of your shift is the best. Now, most people aren't sitting in front of a light for six hours unless you have them, you know, built into your home. Um, but, but for the most part, doing at least 20 minutes um, to 30 minutes um, 
is very, very beneficial. And again, this is uh, a lot of this research is looking at people with seasonal affective disorder and how it impacts their mood. Um, but there are studies demonstrating that this has benefits for alertness amongst shift workers as well. Um, so I would suggest that when you get up for your shift, especially if you're getting up and it's dark outside, which if you live in a northern climate and the days are very short, then absolutely it could be um, dark or getting dark. Um, and that could go for day shift workers as well. Um, you definitely want to, you know, while you're getting ready, while you're eating breakfast, while you're checking emails or doing whatever you're doing, that you have that light next to you. You don't have to stare at it. You just need to have it in your periphery or um, in your awareness and, and being exposed to that so that it is um, having the same impact as if you were sitting, you know, outside or next to a window that had light. And a lot of people say, well, is it, you know, is it the same thing to be, you know, sitting next to a window as it would be outside? And the answer is yes. If you're having light exposure, um, even if it is indirect through a window, then that is reasonable as well. Now, at the same time, you want to avoid bright light at the end of your shift. So as soon as your shift is done, you want to be getting into sleep mode. So this would be like at nighttime when the sun goes down, we, we dim the lights in the home, we start to turn our electronics off. Um, of course, we don't have the natural sun going down when we're coming off of a night shift. So you make the sun go down by putting your sunglasses on um, and or using blackout blinds in the bedroom. Now, you want to make sure that you go to bed as soon as possible after your shift ends. So ideally within one to two hours of getting home so that you can get the most amount of sleep. You can stay as close as possible to your regular circadian rhythm versus pushing sleep back farther and farther and farther. And it also reduces exposure to daytime light. So what you don't want to do is, you know, go to the gym and run errands and meet a friend for breakfast and this, that, and the other when you are coming off of a night shift. You want to prioritize your sleep. If you want to do any of those other activities, get home, get to bed, get your sleep, and then get up earlier before your shift. Do those gym, errands, friend, visiting activities, and then you go into your night shift. Now, when you're transitioning between day and night shifts, you want to aim to wake up at least three to four hours after your night shift would end. So for example, if your overnight shift is 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., then you want to, in the days leading up to that night shift, you wanna put your bedtime later and later and later so that you're waking up at least three to four hours after the end of your shift. So that would be 10 a.m., 11 a.m., noon time, what, however you can shift your sleep later and later, that's what you want to do. So that again, you're not having this huge difference in you know, going to bed at 10 p.m. versus going to bed at 10 a.m., which is like polar opposite and super hard on your body. I hope that makes sense. Now, a lot of people ask me about melatonin for sleep when you're working shifts. Um, melatonin is definitely beneficial, but only for a select group of individuals. And usually the problem um, that melatonin solves is more so the falling asleep, but it doesn't as much help with the staying asleep. Um, what you do want to do is take it in the morning after your night shift, so 30 to 45 minutes before you want to be in bed, so maybe as soon as you get home and you're kind of getting ready to, to get into bed. You don't want to take melatonin all the time, okay? So what we know for individuals is that melatonin is not meant to be a daily sleep regulator. Now, this, this is different depending on your age and depending on why you're taking melatonin. So if you're, you know, um, if we're talking about children and, um, you know, individuals with ADHD or other things, I'm, that's not the population I'm speaking to. I'm speaking to adult shift workers. If you want melatonin to help, then take it only when you are wanting to transition onto a different shift schedule. Um, that's why melatonin works so good for jet lag because individuals take it the day before or two days before they're intending to get onto a new time zone and then once they're in that new time zone for one or two days. You still have to avoid daytime light exposure 
And you still have to make sure that you are exposed to light during your night shift because melatonin in and of itself is just not going to be effective on its own. Um, and again, this is just a small piece of the puzzle when it comes to our sleep hygiene as a whole. Now you'll notice the bottle um, on here is one milligram and that this is a, a natural uh, brand supplement. There's some research to suggest that a lot of the over-the-counter, well, it's all over-the-counter, but a lot of the um, big brand um, types of melatonin have way, way too high or like negligible melatonin levels in them. So I urge you to get melatonin from a reputable source, which is usually found at a reputable natural health store, and aim for half to two milligram doses. You'll find melatonin in the 10 milligram range and you might think to yourself, gosh, 10 milligrams gotta be better than one milligram. Um, not when it comes to sleep. All of the Mayo studies suggest half to two milligrams is plenty when you're adjusting your circadian rhythm um, as a shift worker. So when it comes to adjusting circadian rhythm, um, what should, um, when should you avoid phase shifting? So phase shifting is, is when you're trying to get yourself, um, your circadian rhythm shifted. And this is where I said early in the presentation that it takes three to five days to adjust to night shifts. So if you're not, um, if you're going to be switching shifts in fewer than three to five days, don't worry about phase shifting. Just get through the shifts, okay? Um, this is where you would rely on naps and caffeine to make sure that you're awake during your shifts and then really, really be so, um, you know, ruthless about getting um, as much sleep as possible when you go back to your regular period so that you're not, you know, accruing these massive amounts of sleep um, debt. When people um, on night shifts have days off, um, a lot of people ask, you know, well, can I just go back to my regular day or what should I be doing? It's not super clear. Most night shift workers, when they're not on night shift, they go back to kind of like the way that a normal person would be um, in terms of awake during the day and sleeping at night. It's probably better for those individuals to stay permanently night shifted or to be very close to being on that cycle. Um, some people, as they say here, cram 80 hours of work into a week, then cram all the other shit you need to do into four days off, come back to work completely exhausted and repeat. That is some people's definition of shift work. Um, so again, in a perfect world, if you are switching, um, if you are, you know, have days off, try to delay your sleep cycle enough to wake up at least three to four hours after you would go to sleep after a night shift. So it's similar to what we talked about before with transitioning. So again, um, going to bed late, you know, go, go to bed as late as possible into the morning um, and sleep for however long you need to sleep. So you might not be going to bed at, you know, eight, nine or 10 o'clock in the morning when you would normally get off shift. Um, but you're getting, you're, you're trying to stay as close to that as possible. Um, again, that flip flopping within those 12 hour, like going to bed at 10 PM versus going to bed at 10 AM can be so hard on your body, which is why switching from that day shift to the overnight shift is so hard for most individuals within a short period of time. So the good news is, like I said, we're not all the same when it comes to night shifts and shift work in general. Some people love, love, love working shift work um, for various reasons. I, I mentioned, you know, being around fewer humans is, is a big thing for some people. Um, those individuals who, who don't tolerate shift work or at least night shifts, overnight shifts very well are people who tend to have very rigid sleeping habits. Um, they don't respond well to caffeine and other modes to reduce drowsiness. Um, they can easily be thrown off in terms of their sleep cycle. Um, they would tend to have the personality characteristic of neuroticism. Um, and they just, in general, tend to be morning people. They just don't do well at night. Those are individuals that would not tolerate that. Um, and, and that's just the reality, but there are a lot of individuals who absolutely thrive, um, working overnights and the way that individuals can thrive, even if they don't 
love working overnights is to really engage in self-care. So prioritize physical activity, healthy eating, and proper sleep hygiene. All of these things are going to improve your well-being. They're going to improve your recovery, build your resilience, and reduce your overall fatigue. So ideally, you would still be exercising. You know, they recommend 150 minutes a week. So that's about 30 minutes a day, five days a week, um, preferably before your shift. Now, this doesn't have to be an epic you know, gym session. This could be a 20 to 30 minute high intensity interval workout or a, a strength training video. Um, I'm a huge fan of fitnessblender.com. I've been using the workouts for years. They're all free, they're fabulous, and they're accessible um, in your own home. So if you're getting up at weird times and you, well, now none of us can get to the gym, like I said before, um, but if you want to really conserve your time for sleep and you don't want to spend time going to the gym, changing, showering, whatever, you can just do this in the comfort of your own home. A lot of the exercises are just body weight. Um, you can also join rec leagues that are in the evening and participate when you're not working um, overnights or swings. So there are ways to still engage in physical fitness. Um, but again, I'm a huge fan of fitnessblender.com um, and there's lots of other online workout programs as well. Healthy eating is huge. Please do your best to stay hydrated, especially if you are a caffeine drinker. Um, I know it's hard and, and I, you know, we often cope um, with our uh, shift work by treating ourselves to, um, you know, extra yummy foods and that extra sugary latte and everything else. Um, this is unfortunately not serving us in the long term. So avoiding processed foods, vending machine foods, energy drinks, high sugar foods, it's really hard on your GI tract. It's very hard on your blood sugar regulation, your energy regulation. So be really mindful about what you're packing. Try to make sure that you're getting a good combo of protein um, and, and carbohydrates. So the protein is gonna sustain you for longer in terms of not having such dips, peaks and valleys in terms of your glycemic index, that really plays a lot into your fatigue as well. Um, so there are some examples here. I think most of you are, are very aware of what it means to eat healthy. Um, and if not, there's a lot of great resources online to help talk you through meal planning and healthy food prep, um, etc. I wanna go through some sleep hygiene tips as well. So again, we talked a little bit about melatonin, we talked about when you should be going to bed, we talked about light exposure. Even better, during your shift, if you could get 30 to 60 minutes of, of, of well, not even better, we talked about this already with light, even better would be time outside. Um, there's something about being outside in nature that definitely resets your rhythm, um, but making sure that you're using blue light, you know, grow lights, whatever you need to, to get your light exposure. Um, exercising for 30 minutes, ideally before, not at the end of your shift. Making sure that you're taking time during your shifts to relax, to engage in whatever helps you to manage your stress. It might be breathing techniques, it might be stretching, it might be laughing, it might be watching a stupid video, it might be phoning a friend. It, um, you know, whatever it might be, but, but recognize what brings your stress down and insert that throughout your shift. Because if you move through your shift, just a giant ball of stress and expect to go home and just fall asleep, you're, you're fooling yourself. It's not going to happen. You have to be regulating your stress during the day. Instead of worrying when you get home about all the things that you didn't do or that you need to do, you wanna make sure that you're writing those down so that you don't have them keeping you up from sleep. Again, avoiding caffeine within six hours of bedtime. This is hard for a lot of people working shift work. It's like 6 a.m. and it's like, how do I get through the last hour? Oh, I'm gonna go make a coffee. And then boom, you go home and you can't sleep. So really be mindful about cutting yourself off. 
And most people aren't going home and, and drinking alcohol um, after a night shift, but if you're working a swing shift, for example, and you get home at two o'clock in the morning and you're used to you know, having a drink after a shift, um, recognize that that alcohol in your system is going to prevent you from getting into deep sleep and REM sleep. So alcohol, yes, is a depressant. Yes, if you drink enough of it, you will even pass out, but you are not getting proper sleep when you have alcohol in your system. So this is why when people who work days, I advocate if you're gonna have a drink, have it as soon as you get home, so that by the time you wind down for bed, that that alcohol is out of your system. And then be mindful about what else you're eating so that you don't give yourself indigestion when you get to bed. Right before going to sleep, you wanna stop using electronic devices. So again, um, within about an hour of when you wanna be asleep, Phones should be off or not being used. Tablets off, ideally the TV off. Um, a lot of us watch TV before we go to bed and if you're used to that, then that's fine. Um, but really trying to reduce screen time because that light is going to suppress your natural melatonin secretion. If you take calcium supplements for whatever reason, these are natural sleep aids, so you would wanna take them before you go to bed. Magnesium complex and passion flower are other natural sleep aids that you could take. And then iTunes has a, has a podcast called Sleep With Me. Sounds super sexy, I promise you it's not. <laughs> it's this very boring monotone man who tells very boring stories. So if that appeals to your drifting off to sleep, then that's something that you can check out. I'm a big fan of Insight Timer. They've got tons of free, uh, thousands of free meditations um, related to sleep, stress. Um, they also have yoga nidra meditations as well that is um, basically uh, meditative yoga. So lots of options to help you get to sleep. Now you want to aim for that seven to nine hour sweet spot, whatever that is for you. The more active and stressful your shift is, probably the longer you're going to need. I would advocate for no electronics in the bedroom. I don't watch Netflix in the bedroom. My phone is not in the bedroom. I don't have a TV in the bedroom. Um, and I recommend the same for you. It is very detrimental. Now, again, if you've lived your whole life falling asleep in front of the TV, then, and that's working for you, great. Um, for most people, it doesn't. And there are studies to suggest that even the TV flickering with your eyes closed is still impacting um, your, your depth of sleep. So I would urge you to, to get out of that habit if it's possible. People say to me, well, what am I gonna do if my phone's on in my bedroom? How do I set my alarm? Um, believe it or not, they make these things called alarm clocks. Um, maybe your grandparents can explain them to you if you're not sure what I'm talking about. I'm totally kidding. There's really awesome alarm clocks out there now that you can actually dim the light right off so that even the clock um, doesn't show up when you're sleeping. There's some great alarm clocks that um, incorporate a light that slowly turns on, you know, as a person is waking up to resemble the sun coming up. Um, all kidding aside, alarm clock is an excellent investment. It is not even very expensive and I highly recommend it over using your phone. Make sure your mattress and pillows are comfortable and only use your bed for sleep or intimacy. Um, do not fool, fool your body and mind into thinking that the bed is for eating and watching TV and talking on the phone and everything else that you might do in bed. It becomes very confusing, even just laying in bed and worrying. If you make a habit of that, your body will not be able to sleep when you go to bed and that is not what you want. Um, if your bedroom is not sound or light proof, then you want to invest in some good, you know, light blocking, um, you know, um, I'm brain farting, but you guys can see <laughs> what I'm making on my face, sleep mask, um, otherwise uh, um, um, earplugs as well. And really committing to this, you know, take control of what you have control over. Um, and that is your sleep. 
and all the other stuff you do for your self-care. Nobody has control over that except for you. And, and get support from others and make sure that they support you. And maybe that means setting some boundaries. Um, maybe that means when you go home after a night shift that your phone is off so that you can sleep. So that if somebody just happens to phone you and, and maybe catch you, um, that they can't catch you because your phone is off. Okay, so be very clear and be very real, you know, um, hard and fast about not letting anybody interrupt your sleep. Okay, I know we're getting to the end of our time here, but I want to quickly touch on on call duty. I know a lot of you who are watching in here um, have on call duties. Um, as is this, they say in this cartoon, I am an oncologist. You don't have to be an onco cancer specialist to be an oncologist. A lot of us spend a lot of time on call. So what the on call duties mean is that you are not in the hospital, but you are available to give advice over the phone or come in if needed, usually on the weekends or evenings. Again, hospitals save money because a lot of the times they're not paying people to be on call. Um, but those people are at the whim um, if they should need them to um, assist. On-call duty is not fun. Um, people have to plan their lives around their on-call schedule, which means limiting behaviors or activities that they would otherwise do. So for most people, if you know you're on-call, um, we have to limit how far we venture from the hospital. We have to limit um, whether we might be engaging in, in you know, drinking or um, you know, um, other recreational activities that might interfere with our cognitive function. And this is stressful because we feel like it's an interruption of our home life. And just knowing that we can have to shift into our professional role at any time is going to impact um, us on a personal level. And for many people, this has a major impact on their health, their lifestyle, and their interactions with family and friends. And physicians who are on call consider it, depending on the study you read, the first or second leading stressor in the work that they do. So the consequences of on-call are that very often we're working longer hours than normal if we are getting called in and we have expectations to work at night and not all of us want to work at night. And we can have sleep interruptions and difficulty falling or staying asleep because we're thinking about getting called. And what's interesting is that those who are at home in their normal schedule when they are on call actually have less sleep than when they're away. People who are away, so if you're away doing the locum shift, chances are you're gonna sleep okay knowing that you're on call because you don't have all the other family and home obligations that you have when you're at home. So that's just kind of an interesting little um, studied tidbit. Um, there are studies that have demonstrated that even when individuals do not get called in when they're on call, they are more tired, tense, and unwell and have higher cortisol levels the morning after being on call. So just knowing you could get called has the same health ramifications of actually getting called in. Um, physicians also um, say that they have a higher incidence of mental health concerns, including anxiety and depression um, as well when they are on call. And for some individuals, we don't think about this, and again, it depends on the geographical region where you work, but there's personal safety issues too. If you're having to leave work or go into work in the wee hours of the night and it's not in a safe neighborhood, excuse me, or you don't live in a safe neighborhood that requires you to be out, um, you know, that, that's, that's not good for your well-being either. So how do we cope? Um, because the on-call isn't going away. Again, a lot of us are required, um, you know, especially those in surgeon specialties, uh, certainly emergency and critical care. Um, we are required to be on-call. And um, I urge you to, to embrace that on-call does not have to mean working. And I used to be in the habit of, you know, when I was, I was on call 50% of the time when I was at the University of Guelph and man, those weekends I'd be like, well, I'm on call. So I may as well just like be in my office working. Um, no, 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 no. Okay. So just because you're on call does not mean that you default to working. Really try to um, still do life activities. It might not be the same as what you would do if you weren't on call, but try to do that. And I would get to the point where I would just say to my team, 
I'm going to yoga. I'm going to be in class for an hour. I'm not taking my phone in. So just know between this period, I will not be reachable. Okay, so if you can carve out some unavailable time, especially if we're talking an hour, 30 minutes to an hour, they will survive, okay? And, and ultimately, you have to look after yourself. And, and maybe in that hour, there's a backup plan if there were some earth-shattering, life-threatening thing that needed immediate attention. Otherwise, know that they're going to get through it. Um, uh, they have to. Make sure that you're getting compensated for on-call. This can be a big um alleviator in terms of the stress that well you know what the good news is at least i'm getting paid to be you know um on call set boundaries regarding how you want to be contacted and when you want to be called some people like the heads up i do not like the heads up i just want the call i don't need to know the maybes and the what ifs call me when you need me and that's the other big thing for me too, is that I do not want to be contacted by text message. I don't want to be sitting and checking my phone all day long. If you need me, you call me. Unless we've made some prior arrangement, you know, text me when you get the results of this blood gas and then I'll check in or whatever it might be. Um, again, I'm speaking to what's important for me. Identify what's important for you. How do you want to be contacted and when do you want to be contacted? And this allows you, when you have those boundaries and those expectations, to um, you know, be mindful of your phone notifications so that you know if your phone is set to ring or vibrate when you get a phone call, then you can take comfort in knowing, well, I only need to listen for my phone to ring because I know that I'm not you know, relying on text messages and other things. And the biggest piece of advice if you do on call is when you are not on call, do not respond to messages or calls. That is your time. Make sure that your phone is off, you are not accessible, you are not available. Be ruthless when you are not on call about not being available. And I know that there are some individuals, they say to me, especially managers, well, I'm always on call, I'm 100% on call. Nobody should be 100% on call. Please, I urge you, if you are 100% on call, find someone else to share your call or find a way to carve out time when you are simply not available because it is not good for your mental health and well-being. As an advocate, I implore you um, to find support. Okay, so that brings us to the end. The take-home message obviously being we all need to wear sunglasses and nap all day long. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, there was uh, many other messages, but I, I just really loved this photo and it reminded me of some of the things that we talked about. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning of the session, um, again, uh, that I am an advocate for well-being. If you're interested in learning more about veterinary wellness topics, you can visit my website. There's tons of blogs on there and some resources for you, as well as information about the programs that I run. I'm also very active on social media, so you can follow me on any of the regular social media platforms. Um, but that's it. I, I want to thank Western Veterinary Specialists in Calgary for prompting uh, this session. It was supposed to be an in-person session that was planned eons ago and of course COVID hit and so we shifted to online. So thank you so much for that prompt. I know some of you are watching um, because you um, saw this mentioned on social media so thank you for coming as well. And I'm going to hang out um, and just watch for questions um, for a few minutes here. If anybody has to leave then um, please feel welcome to to log off anytime and um, again yeah if you have questions um, my email address is on my website as well you can shoot me an email or you can um, take yourself off mute and, and ask it verbally or you can write it in the chat box but otherwise I hope everyone got something out of this and I wish you all um, continued health and safety and wellness um, just based on what we're going through now with COVID-19 and then also, um, of course, into your, your, your shifts and, and your on-call, whatever it is that you're dealing with. So thank you so much, everybody. 
Okay, so I'm going to share a, a question that's come through the chat box here, um, asking about research about the use of sleep aids like trazodone um, on the quality of sleep. That's a really great question, and thank you for posing that. Um, I will share um, just on a personal level for myself. I um, went through a, a really difficult breakup last year, and um, I have never had such severe sleep disruption in my life. And I've struggled with depression and anxiety for most of my adult. Adulthood, um, and have been able to manage it for the most part. But it was so interesting that my doctor prescribed to me trazodone. And I was very emphatic to my physician. I was like, I don't want, don't give me anything that I'm going to get addicted to. I don't want to be on sleep aids. I have a lot of friends, um, especially in the United States, where sleep aids are much more commonly prescribed, who have been on sleep aids for years. It is controversial about the quality of the sleep. Um, um, so again, I would have to refer, um, I would have to refer you to all of the, the studies that are out there because of course it depends on the sleep aid. Um, and there's also a lot of controversy about the addiction. And even though some sleep aids will say that they are non-addictive, um, they still, people develop a psychological dependency on them. So, um, I'm not a huge fan of sleep aids unless it is a really extenuating circumstance. And, and again, Trazodone was prescribed to me. I, I didn't take it very much. I will tell you, it, it worked incredibly well for me. Um, it definitely helped me to sleep and, and it really um, did not seem to impact my level of alertness the next day, which was another big thing for me. Um, I think most people who would take a sleep aid would say it's very important that you get that full amount of sleep. Otherwise, when you wake up, it can definitely impact your alertness the next day, whether that's because there's still drug in, this, in your system or whether that's because the quality of your sleep was maybe not great. I don't know. And again, not being a sleep expert, um, if you email me directly, the person who submitted this question to me, I can refer you to um, my favorite uh, blog. Uh, he's a, it's the sleep doctor um, and he, he's the MD who researches sleep and um, Michael Bruce is his name and he's written, he's written about everything. And um, I know he's written about sleep aids as well. So I can send you some stuff on that, but that's a great question. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions coming up in the chat. So I know that we're, um, we're getting late and, um, yeah, I, uh, I thank you so much everybody for watching and there will be a recording that will be available, um, that I will be sending to everyone who registered. Um, so, um, if you, you know, feel welcome to even share that recording with somebody else who you think might benefit and otherwise take care and, um, we'll talk to everybody another time. Okay. Bye-bye.